As the ground crew prepare to start the engine, they follow a carefully planned routine that should be understood by all pilots. After the mechanic in the cockpit signals that the ignition and starter switches are off, the prop is pulled through three or four revs in the direction of rotation to clear the cylinders. A live cartridge is placed in the breech of the starter. And after locking the breech, the mech secures the access door. Power flaps are open, as they should be for all ground operations. Carburetor air directens manually. The plane captain is careful to see that no crew member is on the wing stuff and that the man in the cockpit keeps his arms inside. These precautions will avoid possible injury. With engine running, the hydraulic system pressure gauge should show a pressure of 1,500 pounds per square inch. This pressure is necessary to engage the wing locking pins and operate the safety locks. After the wing folding hydraulic valve control has been set to lock, the outer wing panels are swung forward to join the wing stubs. Then the safety lock is pushed down and to the right, mechanically locking the wing hinge pins. As this locking operation is completed, the red indicating cylinder on the wing recedes until it is flush with the surface. There's nothing unorthodox in the proportions and appearance of the F6F. Likewise, there is nothing unorthodox in her flying characteristics. In fact, experienced pilots say that she flies like a trainer. At service loading, she has a gross weight of about 12,000 pounds, but her 2,000 horsepower, double row, WASP engine endows this airplane with unusual speed and climbing ability. The landing gear is sturdily built to take the shock of carrier landings, and the wheels are widely spaced to give maximum directional control. When you man this airplane for the first time, Bear in mind that you are about to fly a fighter equipped with an engine which will develop 2,000 horsepower. You must have an intimate working knowledge of all her instruments and controls and know how to get the most out of her powerful engine within the prescribed limits of operations. Use of the safety shoulder straps is mandatory in this airplane at all times. Adjust your seat so that you have proper vision through the reflector sight on the instrument cowl. And be sure the rudder pedals are adjusted to suit your leg length in order to give you full positive control. Before you leave the line, increase manifold pressure to about 30 inches and check your mags by moving the ignition switch so that the engine operates momentarily on each magneto. A drop of 75 to 100 RPM is considered normal, but if RPM loss exceeds this, malfunctioning is indicated. The hydromatic constant speed propeller should be checked at an engine speed of approximately 1800 RPM. Pull up the prop control to the full low RPM position and observe the tachometer, which should show a loss of approximately 500 RPM. Then return the prop control to the takeoff RPM position and if the RPM returns to its original value, proper operation of the prop is indicated. For close adjustments, turn the vernier clockwise to decrease RPM and counterclockwise to increase the RPM. In order to prevent an accumulation of sludge in the blower clutches and to check on the operation of the auxiliary blower, set the throttle to give an engine speed of 1400 RPM with prop in full low pitch and mixture control in auto rich. Shift blower control quickly from neutral to low auxiliary stage. And when instruments have stabilized, you will notice slight increase in manifold pressure and engine RPM accompanied by a slight drop in oil pressure. A further shift of the blower control from low to high should be followed by another small increase in manifold pressure and engine RPM, but oil pressure will remain fairly constant. Be sure and return control to neutral in one quick positive move. Finally, check your ammeter to be sure the generator is charging properly and don't leave the line unless it is. And don't forget to unlock your tailwheel.
as you taxi out on the field, don't exceed 1,000 RPM. Use your rudder to maintain direction and avoid overuse of the brakes. Visibility from the cockpit is excellent. And there is little need of S-turning to see ahead. As you make sharp turns, try to keep the inside wheel moving a bit in order to avoid rubbing off the tread. When you arrive at the takeoff spot, let the plane roll straight forward a few yards to align the tail wheel. the checkoff list carefully and deliberately. Don't trust to memory. Follow the list item by item. Wings locked. The red indicator will be retracted flush with the surface. Gas tanks full, giving you a fuel load of 253 gallons. 87 and one half gallons in each of the two main tanks and 78 gallons in the reserve tanks. Mixture control, automatic winch. Blower, locked in neutral. Prop control set for takeoff RPM. Electric fuel booster pump on. Power flaps open as necessary. Elevator tab neutral. Rudder tab one and a half degrees right. Aileron tab neutral. Tail wheel locked. Wing flaps up. You can't gun this engine to full takeoff RPM and manifold pressure while holding the plane with the brakes. If you exceed 2,000 RPM, the tail will lift and you'll risk nosing over. Start your takeoff by easing the throttle forward until you have 45 to 50 inches of manifold pressure. This is ample power to fly you off but you can pull up to 54 inches if necessary. The F6F has very little tendency to swerve and will fly yourself off at a speed of about 60 knots. Now let's go back and try a carrier takeoff with flaps down to give a shorter run and a quick positive lift. The flaps are electrically controlled and have no intermediate positions. The control switch is pulled back to lower the flaps and pushed forward to retract them. If the electrical control fails, you can manipulate the flaps manually. Be sure the handle is depressed before moving the lever. If necessary, use the hand hydraulic pump at the right of your seat. Safely airborne, 500 feet or more, retract your landing gear and bring up the flaps. Also, switch off the electric fuel pump. If your mission demands it, you can climb for not more than five minutes with military power using 52 and a half inches of manifold pressure and 2,700 RPM in neutral blower. For normal requirements, however, you will throttle back to rated power or less and move the mixture control to auto lean at all power conditions except for takeoff and military power. For normal rated power, use 44 inches of manifold pressure and adjust the prop control for 2,550 RPM. At approximately 5,500 feet, You'll reach full throttle. Allow the manifold pressure to drop to 41 and a half inches. Throttle back three to four more inches to prevent exceeding low blower manifold pressure. Open the intercooler flaps. 
and shift quickly to low blower. Use 49 and a half inches for rated power in low blower. You will reach full throttle at approximately 15,400 feet. Allow the manifold pressure to drop to 47 inches. Throttle back three to four more inches and shift quickly from low to high blower. Use 49 and a half inches in high blower to continue rated power climb. The full throttle altitude is approximately 21,800 feet. Of course, at this altitude, you will be using oxygen as needed to protect against anoxia. Watch the cylinder head temperature closely. When cruising, never let it exceed 232 degrees centigrade. 260 degrees is permissible for takeoff, military, and rated power operation. Your oil inlet temperature also is important and never should be allowed to go above 95 degrees. Keep an eye on the fuel quantity gauge too and when operating on the reserve tank, watch for the warning light that flashes when this tank is down to 50 gallons. For minimum fuel consumption, use 1300 RPM and 30 inches below 5,000 feet, which will burn about 40 gallons per hour. Now while we have a safe altitude of more than 10,000 feet, Let's observe the stall characteristics of the F6F under various conditions. Here the airplane is approaching a stall with power on and wheels and flaps up. There's little warning in the way of buffeting, but as the stall becomes imminent, controls will be sloppy and ineffective. At close to 62 knots, she'll stall fully and fall off. But smart, prompt action brings about a normal recovery. Now let's observe a power-off stall in the clean condition, where the stalling speed will be approximately 65 knots. The nose comes up and gets very heavy. Response to controls is sluggish. She shudders a little and falls off. But again, normal recovery is brought about by the usual methods. With landing gear extended and flaps down, a power-on stall will occur at about 53 knots. There is very little tendency to spin if prompt action is taken to regain control and recover normally. For a power off stall, with wheels and flaps down, the stalling speed will be close to 58 knots. Again, no adverse characteristics will be experienced and the usual technique of regaining control brings about prompt, normal recovery. The behavior of the F6F in dives is largely dependent on good pilot technique. Her stick forces are fairly light and response to all controls is quick and positive. There is no dive checkoff list, but the required preparations are simple and easy to remember. The throttle is retarded to give 15 to 18 inches of manifold pressure and the prop governed for 2,000 RPM. Power flaps closed. Rudder tab a few degrees left. Elevator tab neutral. After you push over into the dive, adjust your tabs as may be necessary to maintain your flight path. Don't let your speed touch more than 390 knots indicated, and don't exceed 7 Gs under any loading condition. Make a smooth, easy recovery to guard against blacking out, and also to avoid putting undue strain on the airplane. This airplane is not restricted and may be flown through such maneuvers as the slow roll, which is entered at a speed of 170 knots, the loop, which is entered at 190 knots, entered at 200 knots.
as you come in for a normal landing, go through the checkoff list with deliberation and care. Tail wheel locked. Fuel on best tank, in this case the reserve. Mixture control, auto rich. Prop control, take off RPM position. Flaps, down. Landing gear extended. But don't do this until your speed is 110 knots indicated or less. There's nothing tricky about the landing characteristics of the F6F. Bring her in with a little power at about 80 knots indicated. When you have the runway under you, cut the gun and set her down for a good three-point landing. She'll touch at 60 to 65 knots. Let her slow down somewhat before you use your brakes. Then you can bring her to a full positive stop without heating them up unduly. Now let's watch a field carrier landing. Make your approach a little slower than for a normal landing, about 75 knots. But keep your eyes on the signal officer, not the airspeed indicator. When you get the signal, cut the gun and let her hit the mat. In a real carrier landing, you may hang on the wire and bounce, but your oleos are built to take it. When you are ready to taxi to the apron, pick up your wing flaps and open the cowl flaps fully to keep cylinder head temperature within prescribed limits and prevent scorching the spark plug elbows. As soon as you have wheeled into your parking spot, the plane captain will give you the signal to cut the engine. Advance throttle to give about 1,200 RPM for 30 seconds. Then move the mixture control lever into idle cutoff. As soon as the prop stops rotating, cut your switch and wait for the plane captain to call out all clear. Call out to the plane captain, switch off. Finally, shut off the fuel valve. Turn the battery switch to off and cut all other operating switches before leaving the airplane. As this picture has demonstrated, the F6F has no adverse flight characteristics. She is relatively easy to fly and her armament packs a real wallop. Appropriately named the Hellcat, this airplane is known to be a match for any adversary, a fact already proved by the results of actual combat. Meet the Buccaneer, the SB-2A-4, a fast, powerful scout and dive bomber equipped for land-based operations. The Buccaneer also is built with folding wings for use on aircraft carriers. Pulling 1,700 horsepower on the takeoff, the Buccaneer has ample speed and maneuverability and will fly a maximum gross weight of 15,000 pounds. Her bomb load is carried inside the fuselage and may consist of two 500-pound bombs or a single 1,000-pound bomb. The landing gear is stiff and rugged to take the smack down of carrier landings. And the wide spacing of the wheels lend this airplane exceptional stability on the ground. A total fuel...
airplane is stable while taxiing unless allowed to swing excessively. The rudder is effective in keeping a straight course and visibility from the cockpit is good. The brakes are very powerful when cold and should be applied with a smooth pressure to avoid over control. A sharp turn on the ground will leave the swiveling tail wheel in a sidewise position. Always taxi forward a few feet after turning in order to align the tail wheel before starting your run. As you pause at the takeoff spot, go carefully through the checkoff list. Propeller control, low pitch, high RPM. Mixture control, full rich. Supercharger control, locked in low. Carburetor air heat control, full cold. Cowl flaps, open. Tab settings for takeoff are rudder two and one half units right, aileron neutral. Our first takeoff will be made with flaps up, so the elevator tab will need to be trimmed one quarter unit nose down. Fuel selector valve on reserve. Tail wheel locked, and hood sections locked open. You will need 43 inches of manifold pressure at 2600 RPM for your takeoff. Move the throttle smoothly up to the stop, and when you are sure you have full rated power, release the brakes and start your takeoff run. During the early part of the run, a slight tendency to swerve to the left may be noticed, but this is easily corrected by rudder action without recourse to the brakes. A clean wing takeoff like this will require a relatively long run. At approximately 55 knots, the tail will lift. And at close to 80 knots, the airplane will fly herself off. Now let's try a takeoff with the flaps down for the full distance of the takeoff run. For this type of takeoff, the elevator tab will need to be trimmed three quarter units nose down. Again, the tail will lift at about 55 knots. the getaway speed will be around 75 knots, and the run will be somewhat shorter due to the increased lift provided by the flaps. When you are comfortably airborne, the landing gear should be retracted. Continue in a gradual climb until you have an altitude of at least 325 feet and an indicated airspeed of not less than 97 knots. Now you can bring your flaps up a step at a time. The airplane will have very little tendency to sink when the flaps are retracted gradually in this manner. As soon as possible after the takeoff, throttle back to about 30 inches of manifold pressure and adjust propeller to give 2200 RPM. For all climbing operations, be sure the mixture control is set for full ridge and keep a close watch on cylinder head temperature. If the temperature tends to go above 220 degrees, the cowl flaps must be open to provide additional cooling. They create some buffeting at full open and have a high drag. If possible, don't open them more than one half. If head temperature continues to rise, reduce RPM or nose down to increase airspeed. Never exceed 248 degrees centigrade under any condition. The best climbing speed varies from 124 knots indicated at sea level to 109 knots at 23,000 feet. In a rated power climb with service loading, the plane is slightly unstable, but not enough to interfere with normal or instrument flying. For a climb at normal rated horsepower, you will be turning 2400 RPM at 37 and a half inches of manifold pressure. You can carry this power up to 9700 feet, where the shift to high supercharger ratio will be made. As you ascend from 6700 to 9700 feet, a slow, steady drop in manifold pressure will be observed. 
When the indicated maximum altitude for low supercharger operation is reached, retard throttle slightly and adjust prop control to give 1700 RPM. Then shift quickly from low to high supercharger. This will enable you to get 41 inches of manifold pressure at 2400 RPM up to an altitude of 13,000 feet. For maximum cruise at 75% power, you can rev at 2180 RPM and carry 30 inches of manifold pressure in low blower up to 16,800 feet and 32 inches in high blower up to 19,400 feet. The mixture control should be placed in cruising lean for maximum cruise operation, as well as for cruising at 67% and 60% of rated power on long scouting missions, where fuel economy is a prime governing factor. In level flight, you should fly the airplane in good trim to overcome high control loads. The directional and lateral controls have considerable effect on each other and must be coordinated to obtain the best trim. Due to the small aileron angles used, the airplane tends to roll slowly in response to aileron control at moderate speeds. However, this does not indicate any loss of lateral control. Now let's observe some of the stall characteristics of the Buccaneer. This one will be made with power off and wing flaps retracted. The stalling speed is close to 82 knots. The stall is gentle with a slight tendency to roll to left about 15 degrees. If recovery is made promptly, there is no tendency to spiral dive or spin. However, if the stall is held beyond the initial stages, as in this demonstration, the airplane will roll about 60 degrees to the left and go into a spiral dive. Recovery from this situation is slower, but otherwise entirely normal. In a power off stall with flaps down, as seen here, the stalling speed is close to 75 knots. The tendency to fall off to the left again is characteristic, but recovery is prompt and normal unless the stall is held beyond its initial stages, when the roll will be more pronounced, followed by a spiral dive. With power on and flaps down, as in this case, the tendency to roll to the left is accentuated. But recovery can be made promptly in the usual manner. Since the primary offensive mission of the Buccaneer is dive bombing, the recommended technique for handling this airplane in dives is extremely important. In preparation for diving, the checkoff list should be followed step by step. Fuel selector valve on any tank except right main. Mixture control, full rich. Propeller as desired, but never permit the RPMs to exceed 2880. Throttle set to hold manifold pressure at not more than 20 inches. Cowl flaps closed. Rudder tab, one and a half units left. doors open, diving flaps open. As the plane is flown into the dive, roll elevator trim wheel forward one half turn. The airplane is steady in the dive and can be rolled easily with the ailerons to stay on the target. Terminal velocity will be close to 261 knots at the end of a 10,000 foot dive. About 30 to 40 pounds will be required on the control stick for a normal pullout. This stick pressure can be reduced by slowly and carefully adjusting the elevator tab. Such a procedure will affect a gradual recovery and not put undue strains on the airplane. However, this should be considered as an emergency method. The Buccaneer is capable of performing the usual acrobatic maneuvers, but it should be allowed to fly through each stage of a maneuver and not forced, particularly on top of a loop such as this one, which was entered at a speed of 216 knots. Oh, right.
performed at a starting speed of 195 knots. turn, executed at a starting speed of 243 knots. entered at a speed of 205 knots. speed of 173 knots. Vertical bank performed at 170 knots. a normal landing, the checkoff list should be followed methodically, point by point. Mixture control, full rich. Fuel, on reserve. Pause long enough to check fuel pressure on right main to guarantee an adequate reserve. Carburetor air, full cold. Adjust propeller to give 2400 RPM. Wheels down. The warning horn will blow if gear does not extend fully. Flaps, down. Tail wheel, locked. As you approach the runway, throttle back to about 90 knots. Make allowance for the fact that the airplane will float a little with power on. If you are coming in light with the center of gravity somewhat forward, a three-point landing is difficult. In this case, land wheels first and let the tail wheel come down on the runway before applying your brakes. You will get best results by not touching the brakes until you have slowed down to about 54 knots. Then you can bring the airplane to a stop by a smooth, full application of brakes and avoid heating them up too much. Now let's watch a field carrier landing. You use the normal landing checkoff list. Of course, for an actual carrier landing, you also would unstrap your parachute unlock the tail wheel and put down the landing hook. This time your approach will be made at around 85 knots, but remember to watch the signal officer, not the airspeed indicator. You'll be coming down to the mat in almost a stalling attitude. At the signal, you'll cut the throttle, put the nose down very slightly, then pull back on the stick, and make a normal landing. In a real carrier landing, you'll hang on the wire and smack down with some bounce. But that's normal and the landing gear can take it. The Buccaneer is fast, easily maneuverable, and armed to defend herself adequately. She demands nothing beyond sound pilot technique to perform her scouting missions ably.
Meet the Avenger, the TBF, a single-engine, three-place folding mid-wing monoplane equipped for use as a torpedo plane, as a horizontal or glide bomber with a capacity of four 500-pound bombs, and as a scout or smoke layer. The TBF is designed to take off from or land on a carrier and can be launched by catapult. When the prop has been pulled through to clear the cylinders, the hand crank is engaged and the starter brought up to half speed. This saves the batteries, which may be run down quickly, particularly in cold weather. After checking prop control in full low pitch, the battery switch is placed in on position and the fuel tank selector valve turned to center main. The electric fuel pump is switched on and fuel pressure brought up to seven to nine pounds per square inch. Next, the starter is energized for 15 seconds. And at the same time, the electric primer is operated for three to five seconds. The throttle is set to one third open and the ignition switch turned to bolt. Finally, after making sure the propeller is clear, the starter is engaged until the engine runs smoothly. As soon as the engine starts, the mixture control is moved to automatic full rich and the electric fuel pump shut off. Many of the hand-operated installations and controls found on other types of airplanes are electrically operated on the TBF. Their hydraulic system is rather complicated, and a thorough understanding of the arrangement and purpose of all her controls is imperative. Don't throw any electrical loads on the system when the engine is not turning at least 1,400 RPM, fast enough to cut in the generator. The major loads are the turret, the transmitter, and the SBAE gear. One motion of the hydraulic control in the cockpit operates the wings, but they can be a giant guillotine, so remember the ground crew. Be sure that the catwalk is clear. If you have any difficulty locking the T-handle, the hand hydraulic pump will give you additional pressure. Push the handle in and rotate it clockwise to lock. If the wings do not snap fully into the spread position, pull them and spread them again. Be just as careful in operating the bomb doors. Make a signal like this get a reply that all is clear. The normal operating pressure for the hydraulic system is 1,500 pounds to the square inch. If the engine isn't operating, or if there's a failure, set the selector valve and use the hand pump. The hydraulic system also operates the cowl flaps. The wing flap. And the oil cooler shutter. Adjust your seat to the highest comfortable position and note that you sit high off the deck. At first, you may find it difficult to judge depth. Visibility, however, is excellent. Before you taxi away from the apron, secure your shoulder harness properly. And fasten your safety belt. To adjust the rudder pedals, put toes on adjustment levers and push the pedals all the way forward. Then with toes under the pedals, bring them back a notch at a time 
to the most comfortable position. Be sure that each pedal has ratcheted past the same number of notches. You can't see your passenger, so make sure he's set before taking off. The second seat cockpit must be kept closed and locked while engine is turning up. A good blast may wreck it. Secure the hood sections and go methodically through the checkoff list. On some early models, you may find a turntable checkoff list like this one. However, on late models, the takeoff and landing checkoff list is on a permanent plate on the right of the instrument panel. Check your fuel tanks first with the selector switch to be sure you have plenty of gas. When flying, make doubly sure that the setting of the switch corresponds with the fuel selection. All three tanks are in the stub wings and are self-sealing. 141 gallons in the main, 80 in the left main, and 80 in the right main. A total of 301 gallons. Without bombs, an extra 270 gallons can be carried in the bomb bay in an auxiliary droppable tank. You want 2,600 RPM for taking off, so push the prop control knob all the way in, full low pitch. There's a vernier control for fine adjustment. Now you're ready to check the two-speed blower for proper functioning. Close the throttle. Move blower control rapidly from low to high. Open throttle until manifold pressure gauge shows 30 inches. Then shift blower control back to low. If a sudden decrease in manifold pressure occurs, it indicates that the supercharger is operating properly. Carburetor air in, direct. Note there is no intermediate position of this air control. Oil cooler flaps open. They're left open all the time, except under conditions of extreme cold. Cow flaps open. For a clean wing takeoff, the elevator tabs are adjusted one notch nose up. But if you're going to crack the flaps, the right adjustment is one notch nose down. We'll make this first takeoff with flaps up. Three notches right on the rudder tab. Aileron tab in neutral. Bomb doors are closed. Hood sections lock open. The TBF taxes very nicely, despite her weight. 13,000 to 15,000 pounds, depending on your load. Taxi and idle at 1,000 RPM to prevent loading up the engine. Use your brakes as necessary to retard speed while taxiing, but don't use them excessively. This is a heavy airplane, and brakes will wear out quickly. Operating limits for your oil pressure are between 75 and 90 pounds. Oil temperature from 60 to 102 degrees centigrade. Fuel pressure, six to seven pounds to the square inch. Cylinder head temperatures can be as high as 248 degrees for five minutes at 2600. Normal temperatures vary from 175 to 200 degrees centigrade at cruising speed. and the friction screw on the throttle adjusted for proper tension. Full throttle gives 44 inches and full low pitch, 2,600 RPM. When the pilot is sure he has rated power, he eases off the brakes. 
The takeoff is made with the tail well down, in almost a three-point attitude. So if the tabs are properly adjusted, this airplane will fly itself off. Let's take her off again with a clean wing. Her stick forces are very heavy, but she has an excellent takeoff. The height of your eye makes the ground appear to be moving very slowly until you get used to the cockpit. As soon as he is in the air, Pilot throttles back to 37 inches and governs down to 2400 for the normal rated climb. Before we go upstairs, let's do a takeoff with flaps down. If you're going to crack your flaps, you will trim the airplane the same way, except you'll have one notch nose down. his speed up to about 60 knots, and down come his flaps. They operate very quickly and give an immediate lift. It is not safe to bring up the wing flaps until you have a good margin of speed and an altitude of 300 to 500 feet. them usually results in a serious loss of altitude, particularly when the airplane is heavily loaded. And remember one other point about the flaps. Don't crack them above 120 knots. You'll get a violent nose-up attitude. Lower your speed before you use the flaps and trim your airplane nose down to hold her level. This engine should be operated in the low blower ratio at low altitudes. The governing factor is whether you can get the desired manifold pressure, remembering, of course, to operate within the proper limits. 44 inches at 2,600 RPM, 39 to 37 at 2,400, and 30 to 26 at 2,100. You'll get better gas economy in the low blower. To change over to high blower, have the mixture in full rich. And ease back on the throttle. This is important. Otherwise, you may set up excessive manifold pressure. Shift with positive movement and make any necessary adjustments to obtain the desired power. In a cruising power climb, it won't be necessary to shift until about 13,000, but 6,000 feet is the optimum cruising altitude. At maximum speed, you will burn your normal gas load in one and nine tenths hours, but with extreme care, you can make it last seven hours are carrying a scout load of 13,205 pounds. Familiarize yourself with a fuel consumption chart for this airplane so as to get top performance depending on your mission. Normally, you'll burn around 45 gallons an hour with about 1,300 RPM and manifold adjusted to give you about 125 knots indicated. 65% of rated power, 2,100 with 28 to 30 inches, gives an indicated speed of about 175 knots. Now that we have plenty of altitude, let's study the behavior of the TBF installs. With power on and flaps and wheels up, she'll stall between 65 and 70 knots. The nose comes up and then gets very heavy. She shudders and falls off. 
but she behaves and recovers normally. Without power and with a clean wing, she shows a little tendency to snap into a spin. There she goes. Again, recovery is normal and rapid. Variations in power or speed have little adverse effect on lateral control. Less, in fact, than with most modern airplanes. Landing condition with power on. The TBF has excellent stall characteristics. She is quite stable, and the usual corrections quickly bring normal recovery. Wheels and flaps are retracted at a speed of approximately 100 knots. On this airplane, because of an interlocking control system, the operation of lowering the flaps can also extend the landing gear. However, to put only the flaps down, press protruding arm on flap lever and move lever down. This leaves the landing gear in the up position. Unless you have a smooth field, it is best to make a forced landing with wheels up. Less damage will usually result than with wheels down. This also applies to an emergency landing on water. If you make a flaps down touch and go landing, you want to pull your wheels up immediately after becoming airborne. To do this, you must first raise the lock lever just to the left of the landing gear lever, then raise your wheels. Be thoroughly familiar with this installation before flying the airplane. After a flap down takeoff, always get 300 to 500 feet altitude, depending on your load, before retracting your flaps. Here's what happens when the flaps are dumped. You will lose about 200 feet of altitude. The versatile TBF may be used for glide bombing, 1,600 pound bomb at angles up to 60 degrees. The usual precautions are necessary for glide bombing. Throttle back to around 20 inches to prevent cooling off too fast or torching. Go into the dive at about 90 knots. And trim rudder left as necessary. knots and a maximum of 315 knots with a lighter load. Remember that maximum, 315 knots. Don't exceed it. The designer knows best what this airplane will take. Maximum allowable engine speed is 3100 RPM. All diving must be done in low blower. Normal glide for this plane is between 85 to 90 knots. And if you slow down before you lower the flaps, you won't have an abrupt lift. After you've gone through your landing checkoff list, the landing approach is made at a speed of 80 to 90 knots. Start slowing down and come across the edge of the field at about 80 knots. down until you're 10 to 15 feet off the mat. Then bring the nose up in a steady, smooth motion, like this. A three-point landing always is desirable, but a slightly tailed first landing is better than setting down on your wheels first. It's hard to avoid some bouts because there is a lot of spring in the oleo. Just hold her steady as she makes a three-point landing and runs out. All right, 
Let's try it again and see how she behaves without power. We're coming in again. We've gone through our checkoff list. The approach is perfectly normal. Controls are heavy and a little sloppy, but they're positive. He gets right down close to the ground and sets her down. No bad characteristics at all. A little bounce and he's down. In a field carrier landing, we'll have the signal officer bring him in normally and give him a wave off. Snap the throttle forward, move it quickly, but smoothly. Except for the heavy stick and rudder forces, this airplane is well designed for service from a carrier deck. For an actual carrier landing, your hook will be down. Tail wheel unlocked. And parachute unstrapped. This airplane was not designed for any violent maneuvers. Not necessary in normal flight situations. Avoid all stunts and other such shenanigans. Familiarize yourself with the position of the cockpit. At first, you'll think you're diving on the field as you make your approach. But she has a relatively short landing run and very little tendency to ground loop. As soon as you've landed, open your cowl flaps. Unlock the tail wheel and retract your wing flaps before you taxi to the line. If you're thoroughly familiar with the electrical and hydraulic systems of the TBF, she'll give you excellent service, whether as a scout, a bomber, or a torpedo airplane. You can depend on the TBF to live up to her name, the Avenger.